Pastor's Heart and Dominic Steele and abuse in the crowded house. The report is out into the crowded house, an evangelical church in Sheffield in the UK. It's a 98 page document exploring spiritual abuse allegations that were levelled at the senior pastor Steve Timmis, who was also at the time CEO of the global church planting movement Acts 29. The key question that the authors attempt to address is to give a comprehensive picture of Steve Timmis's activities in relationship to the alleged harm caused to individuals while serving as an elder at the Crowded House. It's the safeguarding charity 318 that has prepared the report. Here's from the summary section. Consistent themes in these story patterns were that individuals suffered hurt for which there was no opportunity for healing. Christian fellowship and friendships were deeply damaged and some suffered a level of harm that has taken years to recover from. The report states on page 77 that it does not attempt to determine whether any controlling, harmful or abusive behaviour on the part of Steve Timmis or other leaders was intentional. It does find, however, that there is sufficient evidence for the reviewers to conclude that whether intentionally or unintentionally, the culture at the crowded house was one in which some instances of emotional and or psychological abuse took place as a result of persistent coercive and controlling behaviour in the name of Christian vision and ministry. Just let that line sink in. A Christian ministry that a decade ago was being celebrated across the evangelical world with friends of mine here in Sydney telling me that the best of evangelical missional thinking was taking place in Sheffield. We should look to them for leadership. And now, 10 years later, that church has been described as having a culture of emotional or psychological abuse. And those words, persistent, coercive and controlling behaviour. The report is sober, it's reasonable, it's considered, it's measured and for that even more devastating. It gives all of us in evangelicalism reason to stop, read and carefully reflect. Steve McAlpine is with me from Perth in Western Australia. He's a senior pastor, he's a blogger, he's a writer with the City Bible Forum Australia's Third Space. Uh, he went to serve in the crowded house as a 40 year old in 2007. He was older than many of the trainees and uh, through his blog, he's played a significant role in bringing this whole pattern of abuse to light. Steve, thanks for joining us. It's a complex conversation for us to have, but I think it's one we need to do because uh, it's crucial that we in evangelicalism learn the lessons here. Can we start with your pastor's heart and what's been your reaction and the reaction of some of the other abuse victims as this report has been published these last few days? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, I think a sense of sobriety. There's a sober feeling among people, I think. Uh, and the report reflects uh, in the way it's written. It's a very sober uh, report in the way that it's written. And it lets the voices of those who were involved speak for themselves. Now, obviously, there are uh, the report was open for everyone. And so there were people who are uh, saying that there was nothing wrong. And there are people who are saying it was mixed. But the, the bulk of people saying that there was something wrong. And uh, there's a sober sense that it took this long to be solved. There's a sense in which people are saying, uh, why did it go on this long and how come people weren't able to have their voices heard in a system, I think, which presented itself as the, the future of how things should be. <laughs> I think that's probably uh, the key issue for me is that the gap between what was said and many of the things I would still agree with and what was done was so huge that there was a discombobulation in people's minds. And so 10 years later, there's almost a sense of relief that this report has said something external that many people felt internally within their hearts. Mm, because the Crowded House and the book Total Church a decade ago were calling for a reform of evangelicalism and the whole way we did church. Yeah, look, I want to say too that the people that rushed to this were people like myself who are reformed theologically and had a conservative theology, but we're looking for a, perhaps a radical ecclesiology. So I think there were many good things about the book and about the sense of it. I, I was in the UK when the book came out. And um, so what I think with the, the issue was that people looking around and going, is uh, evangelism happening, happening? Is mission happening? Even though we tick all the right theological boxes, so to speak, and we're not going down the progressive uh, sort of Brian McLaren, Rob Bell line, 
is there a place that we can do radical ecclesiology that is also theologically orthodox? And it was quite a siren call to me uh, when I saw, when I heard of the experience of the crowded house. And then we went for a year to see what that was like. And then we're involved for several years after. Hmm. The report kind of gives two different sides to Steve Timmis. Um, on the one hand, it says a lot of positive things about his love for people, pouring time and energy, pastoral care, godly character, sacrificial service. And yet there are other lines, um, manipulation, control. There's the pulpit image, the man in real life, the image and the reality. I'm just looking at page 27 and... Uh, this line from somebody saying Steve Timmis was manipulative, controlling, not uncommon for people to break down in tears during the interviews as they described the painful occurrences that affected them deeply. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting one, isn't it? Let's leave it, pers the person themselves aside and say that type of personality uh, is, is problematic within the church. But I, I, one of the things I think that was said was that um, Steve was able to draw out people's insecurities I think the flip side is the case. If you're a leader who, who brooks no rival, who can't cope with people saying, what about this? Or I think you got this wrong. Or, and, then isn't, and then shuts the conversation down. That shows an insecurity level on that person's behalf that I think is problematic. And so when you go into something like this kind of group, it's not that everything is awful. It certainly wasn't. It was some of my deepest church experiences. Uh, no one would go if it was just terrible all the time. It's the the shift that occurs where you feel completely blindsided, where things were going well, and suddenly out of the blue, you're the problem. And you can't figure out what changed or how did that happen. And once that happens to you in that sort of organization, because you've invested so much of yourself within it, you struggle to try and maintain your place within it. People just don't leave after one run in with a leader like Steve. They leave after two or three or five or 10 years because they try to hold the tension because of the nature of the relationships they have with people. Eventually that crushes them. And eventually they go, how did I waste so much time in that organization? And I'm going to have to try and fix things up afterwards. So I, I, everything is always mixed because I don't think someone who's a strong leader and then who uses that leadership poorly is someone who has no one around them. They've got lots of mm. people around them. It's just the, the, the way it, unfolds usually unfolds quite um talked in a toxic way over the coming years let's just roll down some of the bullet points from the report and then we'll try and do some synthesis after that uh, lack of leadership accountability i'm looking at page 28 a recurring concern expressed in written statements and interviews was the lack of both internal and external accountability that's huge. Uh, for me, one of the key issues when we were in the crowded house and for everyone was you have to be accountable to other people all of the time about pretty much everything that you did. And you'd always be called out for your lack of accountability or being a law unto yourself, which is where I challenged Steve at one point, said, perhaps that's you, not me. <laughs> Um, this report and, and shows it, it wasn't it's, me. It sounded like um, there was an accountability being held for things where actually there ought to have been a Christian freedom where there wasn't a Christian freedom. Have I read that right? Correct. Uh, the issue of, of conscience and making decisions that you as a Christian are free to make that are neither here nor there when it comes to a moral issue. Once you make those things a moral issue and then you place them in the lives of younger people particularly, but I was susceptible to it myself, theologically educated, being working as a pastor and then being over there, um, you, you suddenly are in that place of Every decision I make, I've, it's a moral decision. And then what you end up doing is making no decisions. And that's what the report shows, that even the elders who, outside of Steve, could make no decision, not because they didn't want to, but because they were afraid to, because they had no way of knowing whether that decision would be approved or disapproved of, just no way of knowing. And it could come out of the blue. So even those people who stayed on as elders and said there was no problem, behaved in such a way themselves as if there were a problem because they mm. did not lead because they weren't trained to lead. They were trained to follow, to react all of the time. And yet um, uh, there, there does seem to be a sense of um, uh, high accountability and yet Steve himself totally unaccountable and so a, a disparagement 
Yes, that, that was probably the issue. And I, I, to be honest, I think that was uh, allowable because that was Steve. And I think that was a cult of personality as much as anything. And you notice that across all those sorts of organisations where there's a strong personality at the top, uh, they get a hall pass on a lot of things. But when you actually can stand on the stage and preach the opposite of what you then behave like, that is very disconcerting for people. And I think part of the issue in Sheffield was that it became bigger than Sheffield. As soon as Steve was in the global role, it became, if the whole globe thinks that this is the way to go, then who am I as some humble person in their 20s in Sheffield to say otherwise? And mm. that becomes a very, uh, that uh, disconnect uh, starts to get to you, I think. Mm. Um, the gospel of Crowded House, um, one of the lines in the report, too much sin and too little grace. Did that line jump out? Did that resonate with you as you reflected back on your experience? I guess it, it did because in terms of, and this is once again, the lang how language is used is very important in any organisation. And so what happens is that language gets flattened out in organisations such as that, where a whole series of uh, sort of shibboleths are used to describe how people are and uh, whether they're a law unto themselves or they need to be gospeled more or they're not transparent enough. And these soon become the gospel. They become the, if I can show that I'm transparent, if I can show that I'm being gospeled, if I can show that I'm not being a law unto myself, then I'm doing okay. But the language of gospel didn't seem to translate into how someone was treated if they fell, you know, if they fell, so to speak. And I think one of the, the great dangers of Christian ministry or Christian um, abuse situations is that the language of what people are called to and the freedom that they are told they have is so far from what they end up being able to express. And so I think that's part of the problem. Uh, spiritual abuse is a term that we've got to be very careful with, I think, and how we use it. But I do think that there's something akin to the, the depth that's, that you are spiritually with a group is also the depth of which you're going to be able to be abused by them if they <laughs> decide to turn the screws on you. Mm. That's why there's so much damage. If it was a footy club, you wouldn't care. But this is the church. Mm. Now, the, the report also expressed concern about um, the way people were pastored if they had mental health difficulties. Um, as I read that, it rang a bell back to when I read the book Total Church a decade ago. And I, I remember a decade ago, feeling a little uneasy about a couple of lines in that area. Uh, but I went looking for my copy of the book this morning and couldn't find it. But um, what was your sense as you reread those lines about mental health and pastoral care in the church? Well, my wife is a clinical psychologist and we went over there and she picked up the tone very early on, week one. She said, I'd just be very careful here. <laughs> if uh, this if you, this goes wrong, you'll get crushed by this. Um, and I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she's very insightful. And she did help uh, with some uh, psychological, you know, situations over there for people. But the tone very much was that everything's a sin. It didn't take the idea of human frailty into perspective very well. That if, if you were struggling, if you were a young mum who just had a baby and you were coming off your four day, into your four day blues, that was sin somehow. <laughs> that you're crying and weeping was that you just aren't trusting Jesus enough. Nothing to do with hormones or uh, how you're feeling or the fact that you just don't want anyone in your house because you haven't had any sleep overnight. Now, I think that is where it starts to become problematic. And as for more complex mental health issues, which my wife works with all of the time, uh, I don't think there was anyone in the crowded house who had the capacity to be able to deal with those at any deep professional therapeutic level and if anyone had serious mental health issues they ended up leaving and not leaving well. There was also a struggle for the person who was an introvert and um, I mean I remember reading Total Church and it, it, it seemed to really say you had to be an extrovert you had to have people in your house all the time and it, how, how does an introvert fit in in terms of godliness in that mindset? Well I'm an introvert to some level uh, a loud one, but um, my wife and I would both be people who wouldn't have had that many people in our house all the time because it was, um, yeah, because we're both, both a little bit introverted. Uh, we did notice a good thing that when we came back to Australia, people said, you're much more open, <laughs> more people mm -hmm. around your house. And that's, I said, that's true. So that was good. Uh, 
but introversion was also seen as a sign of being a little bit selfish, a little bit not gospeled, and we've got to gospel that out of you. And that's very hard because eventually you start to say, these aren't issues of my personality, these are issues of sin, and I must work hard to work them out. Now, I saw that damage marriage relationships as well. The key for me is that the women in that organisation who were struggling were much more insightful and much more able to say, here's the problem, than the men, especially their husbands. That caused mm. a lot of tension in my book. I want to uh, thank the women <laughs> who've come out in this report and the women who spoke things back then because they saw it in a more... Uh, in, a, in a deeper way, more clarifying way than many of the men who were kind of blinded by the science of it all. Mm. I mean, you've, you've spoken, and I think the report has spoken about, um, uh, if you like, the weak leadership from some of the other elders in that they were young men, not able to stand up against this strong personality. But we did have a cavalcade of um, some of evangelicalism's finest come through Sheffield as guest preachers, board members, regional leaders of Acts 29, why weren't eyebrows raised from those people? Um, one of the things in the crowded house was that you do life on life, eyeball to eyeball. You don't do that by going to a conference for a week. You don't do that by doing a preaching series for someone when you come to Sheffield. You do that by watching their lives. And there were people that did come and spend some time there and then leave and go, no. So I always say you don't know the person whether just because you're a conference speaker with them. You, mm -hmm. you really want to do life and life, eyeball, eyeball to eyeball, you go and do that for a long period of time. But in the sense too, I also think that there's a sense that, you know, um, one man's uh, terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And uh, there's a sense in which this is getting stuff done. And sure, it breaks a few eggs to make that omelette, but it gets stuff done. I don't think we can break any eggs. If uh, even half the number of people who were quoted in that report were there instead of the full number, that would still be terrible. Mm. There was no sense that anyone who left the crowded house was seen as other than someone who'd failed or let the side down or perhaps not been gospeling enough or whatever. There was no sense in which there was any self-reflection in the crowded house that maybe we got this wrong, that maybe that person left because we broke something in them. Actually, there was, but that was never stated publicly. What happens now to those of you who are victims? Where, where do you see yourself sitting now um, at, in the wake of the publication of this report? Hmm. Well, I don't see myself as a victim. I see myself as someone who got a little bit damaged and bruised by it. And I think, uh, I think you, there's a category, a spectrum of how people feel about it. I think my wife and I were not there long enough uh, or involved long enough for it to completely damage us. Uh, where I see it now, it's been interesting. And yet you do know other people that you would say are significantly damaged. Oh, yes. And I saw why. It's that uh, many of them had invested a lot of their lives in it, more so than we had, that when you pull the rug out from under them, they're told to invest everything into this group, that when they leave, it's like the water just goes over the, cro the top of them. No one has anything to do with them anymore. It is, there's something cultish about that, that once you leave the boundary of that group, you're cast out as an exile. And once that happens to you, it's, it's awful. And there are many people who are unsure of themselves in ministry, never going to ministry again, even though I think they'd be capable of it. And people sort of sitting on the edge of church. Now, there are many good stories too that out of deep pain that I've seen that people have grown and really, you know, God has really been good to them and they found good churches. So those stories are there, but it's been the most shaping thing in people's lives for many of them. And that mm. is, that's significant. Now, Steve Timmis was also former CEO of Acts 29. Um, what's the next move that you see that the Acts 29 movement should make and Matt Chandler particularly, the leader there? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I want to leave that to Acts 29 in one sense. I, I, I don't think that... Um, I think the way big organisations work in America, even Christian organisations, is that um, brand management kicks in. So I'm not sure that anything will actually change. And I do think that the problem was the dovetailing of a big, uh, a big movement of, you know, a church planning movement in the US with something in the UK that wasn't quite right. And once there was an international platform for it, it felt like any problems were pushed under the, under the carpet. Uh, 
Well, you say that, but really that dovetailing of those two movements only really started in 2013 when your experience was back in 2007. And so the cracks were well and truly there in 2007, as you've described. Oh, yeah. Look, I would say uh, large organisations that are Christian, if they don't do their background checks, there's something wrong. Uh, Acts 29 had Mark Driscoll and then it had Steve Timmis. That mm. tells you something. Well, let's, let's just explore what are the parallels and differences between the total church implosion and the Mars Hill implosion? Uh, it's got to be uh, that we're looking for a human being to sort out what is, seem, is seemingly beyond a human being's uh, you know, chance to sort out. It doesn't take our own uh, human sinfulness seriously enough. And we, we've fallen into the line that if we can get a strong man to lead an organisation, that will work. Perhaps it works for a bank. Uh, well, perhaps it doesn't, but perhaps it works for big organisations. But it doesn't seem to be what the scripture says about leadership in the Bible at all. Uh, you go to 1 Peter 5 and the description of how elders are to behave towards the sheep is exactly the opposite of what happened with Mark Driscoll. And it is the opposite of what happened at the crowded house as well. Now, neither Mark Driscoll nor Steve Timmis were prepared to engage in submitting to the in, any kind of investigatory disciplinary process. Um, uh, there is something healthy about doing that, and there is something healthy about this report being published, don't you think? Uh, I'm going to say this, that uh, if you don't submit to some sort of uh, process like that and uh, you sort of hold those things off you probably don't believe your own eschatology everything's going to come out on the last day anyway as christians mm -hmm. and as evangelical christians with an orthodox theology of uh of the day of judgment it would be better to clear those things up in this age because i think that's part of god's um kindness to us that we can sort those things out with people in this age because god will sort them out one one stage um the key issue is really that the self-belief that those people have in their own rightness is always going to blind them to the need to be able to go under a process that is external to their own organisation. Reading this report, um, the report authors are quite clear that the report would have been a better document if Steve Timmis had participated in the process. Uh, but even without that, I think this document will be cathartic to the total church alumni, both present and past. Um, and it seems like a document like this would have been enormously cathartic to the Mars Hill movement had they been able to have one in 2012, 2013, 14. Yes, look, I think it's a good, a great document. I, far more um, wide ranging and uh, expertise than I even would have imagined. I thought it was very well done. And there's just not enough of it. But the fact that we need those sorts of organisations external to the church uh, shows that uh, when things go wrong, churches default to what big businesses do. They mm. uh, put up the shutters, uh, they get out brand management and they get rid of the whistleblower. And that's always problematic. And that just shows that we're more like the world than we say we are. We can have uh, the ortho orth orthodoxy, theological orthodoxy is blinding many people in the evangelical world to the lack of orthopraxy. Mm. Now, Mark Driscoll refused to submit to the report uh, re refused to submit to any kind of disciplinary process and then two, three years later started a new church in Phoenix. Um, uh, would you expect Steve Timmis, having refused to submit to this um, uh, uh, pastoral disciplinary safeguarding report to come around and start any, his own independent church in a year or two again? Maybe, but it's not America. America's the land of second chances, isn't it? It's this land of... Uh, you know, where you do something and then you come back a couple of years later and that's there's a, a narrative to that. I don't think that's the same in the UK. Uh, and I do think that people will be careful in the evangelical world in the UK. They're much more cautious anyway. So there's not that entrepreneurial, I really mucked it up, I went bankrupt, whether that's financially or morally or spiritually, but I'm going to start again. That's not necessarily the same in the UK. So that would be an interesting one to see. I do hope that the elders in the crowded house who are commendable in what they've done in uh, admitting the report, I'd, I'd hope that they'd be able to walk their people through the next steps for their crowded house churches themselves. Whether that means they stay open or shut, I don't know. Hmm. Um, 
as you've reflected on the book Total Church, um, somebody's asked us on Facebook, um, should I throw my copy away now or should I keep it? Is it, is it still a book worth keeping and reading for, for, or for a young church pastor who's not read this book? Would you recommend it? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend reading it along with other books and say there's a synthesis that needs to happen. I, I thought many of the things in Total Church were good. Um, it's just when they're pushed to their extreme and they're taken out of a context. Uh, my experience of the UK was a city of a lot of university students with a lot of uh, people who had no connections with people who, had, who were what I call uh, time rich and relationally thin. And uh, if you want to do that in a setting where people are time poor, because they've all got big jobs in the city and they're relationally thick, they've got families and other networks. If you want to say, I want you to shut that all down to do church, uh, you're having a lend of me. That's not going to happen. So it's got some good things to say. And it certainly is a, it, I think it was an antidote or a, tried to be an antidote to very, very thin Christian community where it doesn't look much thicker than a sports club. Mm -hmm. And I think it was wanting to be an antidote to that. And it raised some good conversations and it probably led to some good things. But as total church, that title itself uh, is <laughs> that says this is the way the church looks like when it's done right. And that's not true. Mm, I think that was my reservation as well. I think um, uh, it was fine if it was your 10th church leadership book to read and you would talk a little bit of this and a little bit of that and uh, where's the correction here? Whereas there are actually some people in our church at the time, it was their first church leadership book that they'd read and they thought everything in it was right because it does set itself up as a critique against evangelicalism as it stood at the time. Well, it's also a case, uh, Dominic, that it's a, it set itself up against a culture at the moment that's fractured, individualistic, isolated, you know, atomized, and people are looking for community that actually matters. And mm. I think in that sense, it asked the right question because uh, Christian communities are doing those exact same things that the secular communities are doing, and people are feeling atomized and individualized, and they want something more. So I don't mm. think there was a bad question to ask. Um, I do think, though, that the answers uh, in the end uh, destroyed people. And part of that is because they didn't have that framework of understanding human frailty and being nuanced and mature about what it means to be a frail human being who's got broken things in their lives. It, it categorised either this or that and nothing in between. And when you're told you've either got to be deep church or no church at all, what do you do? <laughs> hmm. Steve, thanks very much for talking to us today on The Pastor's Heart. Thanks so much, Dominic. My guest on The Pastor's Heart has been Stephen McAlpine. Stephen is a senior pastor in Western Australia. He also works with City Bible Forum in a part of that ministry in Australia called The Third Space. Uh, he blogs at stephenmcalpine.com and uh, he's been talking to us this afternoon about the problems in Sheffield and the report just out. We'll link to that report in the show notes of this program. Thanks for being with us and we'll look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon on The Pastor's Heart. 